Hello and welcome to an online public discussion on EU Turkey relations to the aftermath of the European Council Summit. My name is Ioannis Grigoredis and I'm a head of the Turkey program at the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy. And uh, we're happy to co-organize this event with the Institute for European Policy based in Berlin. Uh, I will be co-moderating this discussion with uh, Funda Tekin, who is a director of the EEP. And uh, we have a very interesting uh, panel today with us to explore different aspects of eu turkey relations as they have been highlighted by the uh, decisions uh, made by the European Council a few days ago. Uh, we have Professor Sanem Aydin Duskit from Sapanji University in Istanbul Policy Center. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Volkan Vestas from the University of Cologne. We have Professor Panagiotis Joachimidis from uh, the University of Athens. We have uh, Mr. Neil Schmidt, uh, who is a member of the Parliament for the Social Democrat Party in Germany. And uh, we have uh, Professor Dimitris Keridis, who is a member of Parliament uh, for the Greek uh, Party New Democracy, the government party in Greece. So, before starting, I would like also to thank our non-resident fellow, Akrem Guzeldere, who organized this panel. Uh, he put a lot of effort in realizing this event, so I'm thankful to him. And I will first uh, uh, pass the floor to Professor Duzgit. Uh, how has Turkey, uh, the government and the civil society, uh, looked into the outcome of the European Council Summit? Is there anything changing in EU-Turkey relations? Is a positive agenda working or not? Okay. Thank you very much, Yanis, and thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, it's very nice to be here and to, uh, to be with my fellow um, friends and colleagues as well. Um, well, regarding your question, the kind of reception that this had in Turkey, well, at the societal level, there wasn't much reception because there doesn't seem to be high societal interest, except, of course, those interested parts of society, um, in, in the relations that are going on with the European Union right now. Uh, there seems to be more pressing concerns that relate to Turkish domestic governance, Turkish economy, uh, which definitely take priority uh, over, over relations with the European Union. Um, having said that, of course, um, the, the political class, there seemed to be some reception at the political level, obviously. As far as I know, the government has just uh, made a declaration saying that, um, that they're happy with the positive agenda, but that they think that, that it should be acknowledged that Turkey is a candidate country and that Turkey will continue working with the European Union and helping the EU become a global actor kind of discourse. Of course, we can sort of unpack that and, and, um, and problematize it, but at least that's been the official response. Um, and of course, there have been some critical voices as well in the political scene, arguing that this is a report which basically consolidates Turkey's position as a, uh, as a third country rather than an enlargement country country, that the report makes very minimal mention of uh, issues that have to do with democracy, human rights, rule of law, fundamental freedoms, um, especially, you know, having been uh, published right after some of uh, some drastic developments within the country, including uh, Turkey's withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention on, on uh, combating uh, violence against women. Um, so this has been uh, this has been criticised. And again, uh, another thing that's that's been um, you know that that there have been some criticisms across uh, the Turkish political and public scene has been the fact that the EU-Turkey relations have been reduced to, um, you know, cooperation or at least an, a, a state of non-conflict in the Eastern Mediterranean and over the Eastern Mediterranean issue, and also, of course, the EU-Turkey uh, migration deal. So that is uh, more or less how the discussion has, has been shaped. Regarding the positive agenda, I mean, this is something that we have discussed in some of our previous gatherings uh, with uh, Funda Tekin and Professor Wolfgang Wessels in, um, in some of the earlier meetings we had after the December uh, Council Summit, as we know that uh, you know, some of the decisions had already been delayed or at least uh, they've been postponed to the summit. And again, this summit, the, 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 the results of the summit will also be evaluated and some decisions will also be taken in the next summit. So it looks like 
we've sort of entered this phase of EU-Turkey relations where we'll be, you know, talking about this issue from summit to summit, where both sides will evaluate the relationship to make sure to, to, to minimize at least the risks and damages that they can incur on both sides. I mean, that's how Turkey-EU relations, institutionally speaking as well, uh, is evolving into rather than a sort of a more institutional, formalized or perhaps, you know, more enlargement based. Um, kind of relationship which we had been grown accustomed to um, over the over the last decades. Uh, so in that sense, yes, you have that kind of um, you know in, in right after December summit. I do remember, you know, we were also talking about whether this positive agenda could work, whether its constituents could spark any sort of a positive reaction from Turkey. Well, you know, one could draw the conclusion which I think would be mistaken and hasty. If one um, have, uh, you know, if one were, were to interpret Turkey's more recent foreign policy uh, maneuvers or overtures in the Eastern Mediterranean due to the prospect of, of this uh, positive agenda, I don't think that is the case. I think the reason why those changes have happened, and of course those changes, as I'm sure as Greek colleagues, you're uh, maybe even more informed than I am about the fact that, you know, bilateral talks have started and there's also now the, this possibility of yet another round of negotiations on the Cyprus conflict, etc. Um, that basically it's just this um, uncertainty about what's going to happen to the balances in the Eastern Mediterranean, now also with the new administration in the United States, you know, how that would play out in tandem with European Union pressure, and the fact that, you know, Turkey was feeling more, I would say, isolated and alienated. Also, of course, given the state of affairs uh, that, that, it, that it enjoyed with countries like Egypt and Israel as well. So we've been seeing in between these two summits sort of overtures towards, you know, a less aggressive language, you know, withdrawing the vessels back at least for a while. And then, you know, making some kind of foreign policy um, openings to countries like Egypt, of course, with which it had hugely uh, problematic relationships with uh, since, of course, uh, the CC's cool there. Uh, so now there have been those changes. But again, I, I don't think those changes are really related to the positive agenda or consequences of positive conditionality, but rather Turkey's need to position itself in the changing global context, and in particular, this changing um, transatlantic relationship with the new administration. So that's how um, I would read it. So, um, I mean, based on that, whether we could speculate on, you know, uh, whether or not this new positive agenda or the, the constituents of the positive agenda that have been articulated in the Borel report, whether or not uh, they could induce any further change, well, I am a bit doubtful. Because if you really, again, go and read between the lines, you know, that report and the council conclusions and everything that's been produced, you would see that there are really very few areas where the two parties can meaningfully cooperate. Now, the, you know, one of the major issue areas where cooperation has been sought for a very long time now, as I'm sure all of you know, had been the customs union, right? The, the prospect of a modernization of the customs union agreement, given that the customs union agreement that dates back to the mid 1990s is very outdated and it needs to be modernized, you know, uh, taking into account the changing economic uh, developments and contexts, both you know, globally, but also uh, on both sides. Well, but if, again, if you read between the lines, it says that, you know, the, the customs union revision is open in principle. Uh, it used to be more closely tied to democratic conditionality. Now it looks like it's less tied to democratic conditionality, but more tied to the Cyprus issue, right? Uh, and the East Med. So it seems to be that, the, the, you know, more and more we see less of a value or enlargement driven agenda, but even elements of the positive um, agenda being tied to these larger geopolitical measures, which are, of course, quite difficult to, um, to resolve, as, as you would appreciate. Um, so, so that seems to be a, a big question mark about how these will be realized, given the difficulties and the conflictual areas that, that exist between the two sides. Again, there seems to be problems, even in those areas where cooperation is somehow um, continuing, like on migration, uh, there seems to be problems because, again, if you read the text, you will see that the European Union is not very happy with the way in which Turkey has been readmitting less individuals than 
then it's supposed to be readmitting. So they argue that they're actually, get, you know, taking more migrants than Turkey is actually readmitting them, and that this goes against the nature of the deal. So even there, it looks like the migration deal is also um, subject to certain hiccups. So all in all, I don't really see this so-called positive agenda making a big impact in the way in which it can induce you know, Turkey to sort of go to a fundamental change of behavior, both domestically speaking, but also foreign policy wise as well. Um, so I know this has been a rather, I, perhaps a pessimistic uh, start to the discussion, and I would hate to say these, I, I wish I could be more of an optimist, uh, but at least this is how things look from the where I'm standing. Thanks. Well, thank you, Senem, for um, this. Uh, right, maybe it's a rather realistic assessment, I would say, and I really share most, well, um, all of the points that you were raising. And I think, well, at least um, the difference between the um, the European Council conclusions of last week and the one to December is, to my understanding, at least, there is some mentioning of the um, rule of law issue in democracy, yeah. which was missing, uh, totally missing and absent in the December uh, conclusions. But I fully agree that um, there could be more, and I also agree with regards uh, to your assessment of the customs union update and the conditionality with regards um, to that. But now I would like to give the floor to um, Wolfgang uh, Wessels, uh, who holds an ad personam uh, Jean Monet at the University of Cologne and is director of the Center for Turkey and European Union Studies, also at uh, the University of Cologne. He is a distinguished expert on EU-Turkey relations. Um, and another research passion of his is the European Council. Uh, and lately he has also taken to um, analyze uh, the narratives of the European Union and of the European Council on various as aspects. So Wolfgang, in your assessment on the narratives, uh, you know, um, up, leading up to the December 2020 European Council Summit um, that you also published as a viaduct uh, policy paper, you observed a significant shift in the European Council conclusions as a reaction to worsening relations. So how would you actually reassess um, this observation in view of uh, last week's summit, as well as of uh, the joint communication by the high representative, which I think we have to um, closely uh, link to um, the council um, conclusions. So Wolfgang, I'm uh, interested in hearing your um, assessment. Yeah. Is a council conclusion a change of paradigm? Uh, I would just for perhaps discussion purpose, be more optimistic. For the EU side, I cannot say any deeper things on the Turkish side. What it's really striking that the European leaders again say stressed the strategic interests uh, for the Eastern Mediterranean. And that they take that serious. They want to come back in June on that again. And they talk about mono monitoring, monitoring, uh, monitoring, uh, difficult language is English, uh, the developments. Yeah, so let's say they take it least uh, very serious. And um, I think that should be a positive sign. The next step I would like to say, they have more carrots than sticks than in December. Uh, at least they offer more. Uh, the mood seems to me more positive to do something. Partly because at least that's what is uh, in the text uh, because of the Turkish uh, uh, moon continuation of certain provocations in the Mediterranean, as they see it from the EU side. So I think they take it positively, the reactions by Turkey. And they say we need to do something together. Uh, and uh, I think that's an interesting way. Nothing is said again, like in the last conclusions over the last years, about accession and enlargement. Uh, I think that's I would say frozen somewhere in the background and apparently nobody wants to deal with that and create conflicts. I think we should see that clearly. Something has been said and Funda mentioned that already, more on the rule of law and human rights. That has not been said in December. The interesting point is, Senem, I think you said that it's not a conditionality. They say we keep that in our dialogue, I'd say. But that doesn't mean for the customs union, for example, that there is a political conditionality like perhaps the first Copenhagen criteria says. I just wonder, and here I hope that our member of the parliament will come in, how far the European parliament will accept that. Because uh, we should not forget uh, at least any legal change uh, 
needs to be ratified also by the European Parliament. Um, and I think that's an important part. The positive agenda, we need to be careful, and here I agree with Senna, uh, that this is not a gift. Uh, and as soon as you start, you will come to a good end and everybody will profit from it, uh, forgetting about all the other issues of uh, enlargement or human rights, etc. So it's positive in itself. I wonder that. And uh, you mentioned some points, for example, in the uh, modernization of the customs union. The interesting point is that they start that, first of all, the present customs union needs to be applied to all member states. <laughs> Uh, and you know uh, which member state is not yet part of the customs union from the point of view of Turkey. So Cyprus comes back here. So I, I wonder how, if the negotiation starts without that Cyprus is part of the present customs union arrangements. Uh, and we know how difficult it will be for services. It will be very difficult for public procurement in Turkey, for state aids, um, and perhaps for the EU on agricultural project. So. Uh, we know that how the EU negotiates that over years. I don't know how long it took for the Canada agreement, I think more than 10 years, and it's still not yet totally ratified. So it will take time, and here I agree that this might not have much impact on the political situation as such. So it's a promise for the future. I think it might work for everybody at the end in a positive sense, uh, but this is far away. Then they say high dialogue, dialogues should be installed. Uh, I remember that this was already in the EU-Turkey statement in 2016, and then the EU discontinued that because uh, of domestic developments in Turkey, so as kind of sanction, uh, which was, of course, not very helpful. My point would be also from the European side, high dialogue means really have a dialogue on the highest level, uh, I would say, um, given the let's say, political structure, the presidential system in Turkey, I think everything which might work forward looking from the EU side needs to go uh, through the president. So I think it's good that apparently uh, von der Leyen and Michel are going to see Erdogan in, in the next week. So I think that's the way to go high with, that, uh, with the uh, high uh, dialogues on high level. Then we have this people-to-people -people contact, and there are the visa liberalization behind that. And again, looking at uh, the communication of the high representative, we see there are still quite a lot of problems. And I don't see it yet how this will be solved. Of course, we are all for it. I come back to that in my last statement, because I think we should continue to have the EU-Turkey bridge. And so I think people-to-people, -people, academic to academic uh, uh, cooperation should continue. I, I think the major points on the agenda will be now not the positive agenda. It will be on one side the financing of the refugees within Turkey. And there, I think the European Council make a clear decision. When they say we invite the Commission to make a proposal to the Council, this is a polite form of saying you should do that, Commission. I give you the order to go ahead. And I think the Commission. Um, we like to do that. So I think that's a positive sign, the financing, and we know that there are also problems with that, uh, but I don't go into detail on that. More problematic is the migration uh, cooperation, and um, Sena mentioned that, and uh, this is still seen as a major threat for Greece, especially uh, for the Greece uh, population, and of course for our relations uh, between the EU and Turkey. So migration, I think, will be the helpless, I think, is the union concerning Cyprus. Um, and the question will be how important will Cyprus be in this kind of negotiation? Because I guess as far as I look from the outside, uh, there are few chances that uh, the United Nations mission will work at the end to have a united Cyprus and uh, therefore, let's say, a very calm and peaceful development. I think this scenario looks rather unlikely. So the problem will be how far will the Cyprus issue block the others? Yeah? And of course, we know at one or two uh, member governments or governments of member states uh, will see that as a kind of deal. Uh, so uh, I think that will be a major issue. Also on the EU side, how far, let's say, will they get blocked by Cyprus? Um, there was 
couple of weeks ago, uh, let's say something that Cyprus blocked, a position of the EU concerning Belarus, which let's say where Cyprus doesn't have any interest at all, uh, just for getting their support. So I think that will be for the EU a major issue, I guess for Turkey too, but I think that might be a blocking way. Uh, interesting enough, and I think that's very uh, important, so still very weak, are, uh, let's say, geopolitical considerations which come in when they talk about uh, the regional conflicts um, or regional crisis, Libya, Syria, uh, Caucasus. Um, and I think here, also in the report by the High Representative, we see that there are clearly differences of interest and the EU also in one conclusion of the European Council. Uh, it was clearly said that uh, the moves of Turkey in Syria uh, violates interests of the European Union. So it's not only, let's say, different positions, but also a clear, perhaps, conflict of interest. So I think how far, for example, high dialogue will be helpful to get there to a common position. And I think, Senator, you mentioned correctly, one major player in this field is the United States and, of course, also Russia on the other side. So uh, to see how the EU can manage in this area, it's still very open. And we know that the EU come foreign and security policy might do actions. They have sanctions against Russia, for example. Uh, but um, that at the end, they are not really a strong player, at least as those who are now in the field in Syria and uh, Iraq. Uh, so I think that will be an open question. When I talked about carrots and sticks, uh, I think the sticks are there. It's mentioned that if there are, again, some kind of um, renewed provocation, that's a term, uh, the EU will use instruments at hand. Interesting enough, the term which is in the treaty, namely that it's restrictive measures, that was in the December, it's not repeated. I don't know what it means, it's not repeated. Uh, perhaps it's a sign that uh, the EU doesn't take it as serious as perhaps in December, but that's a pure guess. Uh, concluding, I think there are a lot of points on the agenda, which partly overlap, which are partly, uh, let's say, contradictory, where you have different forms. My question is, how will the EU and Turkey manage these problems? Yeah? Just by having ministers meeting or high civil servants meeting, that might be helpful here and there. But how do they get these things together? The question is the famous package, the package deal between both sides. How to get to really an agenda which then works to a certain degree at least. And that I don't know. The, um, there is no offering except for saying uh, this is, uh, there should be good relations hopefully beneficial relations for both sides um, and looking for cooperation in this. But let's say no mentioning of accession, no mentioning of the association in the strict sense. I wonder where this, let's say, gets to some kind of common uh, package, common agenda. Last point for us as academic agenda, we have a lot of things to do. Let's say there are a lot of incentives now, more than perhaps in December, to work, to analyze, for example, the positive agenda, but also uh, the uh, geopolitical interest of Turkey and of the EU, or I think it's more important to say of EU countries and the EU, because of course there might be different interests in Libya from Italy or France and perhaps from Finland. So I think that's a major issue we have to study and I hope that this Funda will lead to reinforce what we think is good uh, some kind of EU-Turkey bridge in our academic networks and community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Vessels, for a very interesting presentation. I would like to highlight two points from uh, what you said. First, the significance of the Cyprus question. And uh, this uh, may make, I, my opinion, uh, uh, Germany or France or the European Union uh, more interested and supported the UN uh, attempt to revitalize the bicommunal dialogue and the conflict resolution process in Cyprus uh, along the established uh, UN principles. So that's something we need to keep in mind. I think the second point is the significance of domestic developments in Turkey and the decreasing 
ability of the European Union to have an influence on them. And I would like to take this point to uh, pass the floor to our next distinguished speaker, Professor Panagiotis Joachimidis, who has been studying European integration and has been studying also EU-Turkey relations, both as an academic and as a policy advisor. He has a very interesting perspective into the issue because he has been involved in the process that uh, started 20, 22 years ago, the Helsinki uh, process that uh, produced some very positive results in EU-Turkey relations and triggered some positive developments in Turkey as well in terms of uh, political reform, democratization, and uh, promotion of the rule of law. So, Professor Yakimidis, do you think that uh, there is no chance to achieve a positive agenda, to repeat a mini Helsinki in uh, the current circumstances? Can you please unmute yourself? Yes. Uh, first of all, let me thank you very much for inviting me to this extremely interesting discussion with this very, very wonderful, wonderful panel. Now, and let me just tell you that Turkey looks to me like what Churchill said about Russia, that it's a riddle in an enigma wrapped in a mystery which is extremely difficult to decipher, you see. But uh, with this caveat, I would say that, yes, it is an extremely positive thing that we have the positive agenda. And I think that we can repeat, actually, the example of Helsinki some 21st years ago, 20 years ago, or something like that. But let me first just say one or two things about the positive agenda. I think the four elements are extremely important. Modernization of the customs union, uh, economic operation in sectors of mutual interest, visa liberalization and funding of um, a new funding for refugees and migration. That extremely important elements but I think uh, that there is something missing in this, and this is the uh, role Turkey can play in the security arrangements of the European Union. In other words, I would be quite interesting, it would have been quite interesting to see an invitation for Turkey to join the permanent structural cooperation and indeed the European defense agency. That would have been a new and very important element in this positive agenda. And this is completely missing, though there is a slight reference in the Borel report on, uh, on Turkey. A second element which is missing from the positive agenda is the uh, relates to the refugee migration, to the statement, the EU Turkey statement of 2016. In other words, the uh, statement of the European Council speaks about new funding for the refugees and migration, but it fails to make a reference to the need of revising the statement on refugees and migration and it's important to revise this statement, at least for one specific reason, as far as Greece is concerned, namely to provide for re uh, returns to Turkey, not only from the Greek islands, but, only, but also from the mainland Greece. That is extremely important, but there is no reference, no reference to that in the statement of the European, European Council. Now, on the Greek policy and whether we can repeat the, say, the example of the Helsinki Council some 20 years ago. First of all, let me just uh, say this, that as far as Greece is concerned, the Greek policy towards Turkey and indeed to the positive agenda should be a very positive one. 
just to put it in a different way, Greek policy should should be somehow summed up in three key terms, in three key words, engagement, inclusion, and conditionality. Engagement, which means that no matter what target we have, whether it is an authoritarian or a democratic polity, Greece has no other option but, but to engage with Turkey, to speak with Turkey, because we are somehow prisoners of geography. We are sitting next to each other, and so we have no other option but to speak to each other. We prefer, of course, a, a democratic Turkey, but that it's up to Turkey to decide. For Greece, it is important to be in a sort of constant dialogue with Turkey. That's extremely important. The second is inclusion. In other words, it is important for Greece to include Turkey in whatever schemes of cooperation emerge either in the Mediterranean or in Europe. My basic premise, basic assumption is that the closer Turkey is to Europe, the better for Greece. And that means that Greece needs to support the positive agenda, and indeed, it has supported the positive agenda. But in my judgment, in my view, Greece should set certain conditions for deciding, say, on the positive agenda at the June European Council. These conditions relate to the accession of Turkey to the Convention on the Law of the Sea, to lift in the Casus Belli, and a number of other items which are important to the Greek side, so that to restore, to restore trust between the two, uh, between, between the two, the two countries. In other words, a Greek policy, uh, which would be, say, um, instrumental to somehow repeating the Helsinki paradigm, could be could be somehow structured in a triptych. In other words, first, the first part needs to be a dialogue between Greece and Turkey to, to, to see whether we can find common ground to resolving the, say, outstanding issues, outstanding different differences between us. Secondly, to promote the um, closer, say, relationship between Turkey and the European Union on clear conditionalities, which I mentioned one or two points, and perhaps in the future, and on the condition that Turkey will somehow restore democratic, um, say, democratic rights and so on and so forth, revive the accession process. And the third element is to expand the EU security role in the Eastern Mediterranean. That is extremely, extremely important. First, to, to have a much, much expanded European Union role in Eastern Mediterranean, and at the same time, to promote this idea for an Eastern Mediterranean conference to include also Turkey as, a, as the first step for constructing, for building up an Eastern Mediterranean organization, which would include all countries, including Turkey, uh, for the Eastern Mediterranean region. I think this is, this is highly important for the region instead of, ca of having this antagonism and these competitions. But to do that, we need somehow to find a solution to the Cyprus problem. And I would agree with Mohan Vessel that the Cyprus problem might be actually the, the real difficulty in, prom in promoting both the uh, positive agenda and in finding other, say, cooperative schemes 
in Eastern Mediterranean. And on the Cyprus problem, it is important to find the common ground, and this common ground can be found only on the basis of the, uh, the Security Council Security Council resolutions, because any other option, it would not actually set the perennial Cyprus, the perennial Cyprus problem. So it is important to 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 see that this say um, conference, which will be convened by the Secretary General in late April, April succeeds in finding this in fighting this common ground. But on the whole, I am quite positive and quite optimistic about the positive agenda. I think both the European Union needs Turkey for a number of reasons. It needs Turkey to deal with the refugee migration problem. It needs Turkey uh, in order to manage various conflict uh, be it in Syria or in Libya, it needs Turkey for economic reasons, but also Turkey needs uh, uh, Europe. First of all, because the, Europe, the Turkish economy is highly integrated within the European economy. And so there is a mutual interest, say on both sides, just to promote a sort of a normalized relationship, uh, and have some sort of, say, a new kind of relationship, but on clear conditions. In other words, this process, as the statement of the European Council says, it needs to be phased, proportional, revers reversible, and I would add conditional. Turkey needs to fulfill a number of conditions, uh, both domestically, but also with regard to its foreign policy. In other words, it need, it, this relationship needs to be value-based, not simply a transactional relationship. And that I think it is extremely important for both, for the European Union and for Turkey as well, but also, but also for Greece. This is my conclusion and thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, this also very interesting um, sharing your thoughts with us and also thank you for already bringing in the Greek approach and political interests and how Greek should actually approach Turkey and the necessity that Greece actually has to uh, engage and, um, and speak to Turkey. Uh, this is a very interesting and also thank you for sharing your uh, positive assessment of the positive agenda, uh, as well as your suspicions about it, and highlighting then, then what you think is actually missing in the political agenda. I think this is uh, very helpful. Um, now, having heard something about Greece, I would want to also um, bring in a German uh, voice, uh, because I think Germany traditionally plays an important role uh, for EU-Turkey relations. Um, and German-Turkish relations as such are very um, close. Um, therefore, I'm delighted that uh, Niels Schmidt, who is a member of the German Bundestag, had agreed to, uh, to join us uh, today. Niels Schmidt's uh, political career is very long, both on the state as well as on the federal level. Since uh, 2017, he um, is a member of the German Bundestag, where he serves on the Committee on Foreign Relations and where he is the uh, SPD Parliamentary Group's uh, spokesperson. So, uh, Neil Schmidt, um, time and again, Germany plays a rather active role in EU-Turkey relations. Uh, this was uh, during the so-called migration or refugee crisis, uh, the, the case, and um, also recently taking up a rather mediating role with regards to the situation in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. So what is your assessment of uh, the latest developments of uh, the decisions of last week and uh, how, uh, which prospects do you see for the EU-Turkey uh, relationship and maybe also the role Germany can play uh, within it? Yeah, hello everybody. And uh, thanks for having me on this uh, panel. Um, let me start by saying that um, not only vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Turkey, but 
in foreign policy more generally, the German tendency is always uh, to uh, seek dialogue and to play a, a mediation role. Uh, this can clearly be seen uh, in our relationship uh, with Russia. This can also be seen in the engagement and involvement of the German government when it comes to Libya. So it's quite natural that um, in the Turkey-EU relations, Germany has always uh, tried uh, to, to, to build uh, bridges and to mend fences. And certainly there's also a very specific dimension to the uh, German-Turkish relationship, which has to do not only with a long history of uh, close contacts, but also with uh, Turkish immigration to Germany. So as we can see in other European uh, countries, um, immigrant communities uh, bring foreign policy issues uh, to the domain of domestic politics. And so this is clearly the case uh, with uh, Turkey here in, in Germany, as it is the case with Maghreb uh, 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 countries and their um, uh, immigra uh, immigrant communities in Spain or, or France, for example. So that should be should come as no surprise uh, to any uh, practitioner of, of politics. And what we uh, try to avoid um, is to sort of import domestic policy. Uh, 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 domestic political tensions uh, from these countries into our own societies and in our own political system. Um, you should just uh, keep in mind that 20 years ago, we had um, highways blocked by Kurdish protesters. Uh, we had uh, fires uh, set by Kurdish protesters um, in attacking um, the Turkish government for for its um, for its uh, Kurdish uh, policy. Um, so, but as I said, um, you should not read it as a as a too specifically um, directed uh, towards Turkey policy, but it's more of a general issue uh, in all mainstream political parties in Germany that we have a sort of pension for dialogue. And this is, of course, um, also very much embodied by our chancellor, <laughs> who is always trying to, to start dialogues with everybody all around the world. Um, so reading the declaration of the latest EU, uh, European, European Council, my assessment is that the fundamental problems in the uh, EU-Turkey relations uh, remain uh, unchanged, of course. So <laughs> it's very difficult to solve any of the um, um, uh, discussed issues because um, for many years now, Turkey and the European Union have uh, diverged in not only in policy options, but also in very in, 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 in practical politics. And um, this uh, goes back to the freezing of um, and the accession talks. This is, was, uh, speed, was sped up uh, by the authoritarian turn taken by the Erdogan government after the end of the um, uh, peace talks with uh, the Kurdish uh, side, and especially after the uh, failed uh, coup attempt. And so, uh, to me, uh, we are more or less in, in a sort of management mode when it comes to um, uh, Turkey-EU relations. And as long as the Erdogan government does not reverse course, a basic contradiction will remain, which is that anything the Turkish government could do to improve relationships, the relations with the European Union, um, is in 
stark contradiction to Erdogan's um, will to have an iron fist uh, when it comes to grasping uh, on, on power in Turkey. So when it comes to visa liberalization, you will have to reform the criminal code and the definition of terrorism. Uh, when it comes to um, accession talks, it's even more more evident that uh, there there must be a return to the principles of rule of law and a, a respect for human rights. And even when it comes to the customs union, this is not a value neutral or value free issue. It's very much related to rule of law. Uh, and uh, as soon as you touch a uh, the issue of public procurement, um, you will have to attack all the corrupt networks which have been established uh, around Erdogan and his clan over the last few years. So uh, any fundamental progress uh, which can be made and should be made um, uh, is or uh, tends to weaken Erdogan's uh, grip on, on power in Turkey. And this is, to me, the fundamental problem. And that's why, as long as Erdogan and his, his, his friends and supporters are not ready to share power or to take into consideration, in, into consideration uh, the prospect of losing elections, uh, it will be very hard to see any fundamental uh, progress in, in our relationship. And um, this has only been uh, sharpened by two issues which came to the, uh, to the fore in the last uh, six or, or in the last 12 months. Uh, the, uh, Cre uh, the, the Cyprus issue, which has been lingering, lingering around in the background for more than for several decades now, but which could be sort of pushed aside as long as there were, uh, there were improvements on, in, on, in, in other fields. And then of course, uh, the developments in the Eastern Mediterranean and the idea of getting rich by drilling, by drilling uh, for, for gas, which seems to me a, a fancy, because it, it will be extremely expensive uh, to get uh, uh, oil um, extracted from the Eastern Mediterranean and the gain will be quite minimal. Uh, so um, uh, I hope that all the parties concerned will turn to more sustainable sources of energy and invest the money they would love to spend on trading for gas rather uh, to to uh, invest in uh, solar and wind energy, which does not cost a cent, and which is very promising for all the countries in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, but it seems to me that there is a a natural tendency to to go back to traditional power politics um, in this context, and uh, of course. Um, um, uh, our Greek friend, Professor Panagiotis, uh, was right in stressing the importance of an inclusive approach in the Eastern Mediterranean just to create regional forums which exclude uh, one uh, very important uh, country, namely Turkey, uh, seems to me a, a non-starter and a very bad idea, I must say. And so still, um, we've seen quite an improvement in um, EU-Turkey relations over the last uh, 20 years, regardless of the unsolved issue of Cyprus. And uh, so the question is, can we come back uh, to this kind of um, relationship by focusing on matters of uh, uh, cooperation or by, by reviving the idea of uh, bringing Turkey closer to the European Union, bringing Turkey to the uh, closer to the European Union would precondition, or would would have as a precondition a change, a fundamental change of policy from the Turkish side, which uh, cannot really be expected. So we are left with a rather 
compartmentalized approach which uh, may focus on, uh, um, on several issues uh, which are spelled out in the uh, Council's, uh, European Council's uh, declaration as well. And to me, the most important and most urgent issue uh, is uh, the migration deal issue. And there's an alignment of uh, interests on both sides. And all the criticism notwithstanding, I see this migration deal rather as a success story of EU-Turkey relations. There are weaknesses um, which were mentioned, so the question of free admission. Uh, but um, when it comes to the implementation of the financial part of the deal, it more or less worked well. And um, I'm very much in favor of um, extending our financial support to Turkey uh, for um, uh, schooling and housing uh, Syrian refugees on its national territory. You know, there's a lot of criticism uh, and very much uh, justified criticism um, regarding Turkey's policy in northern Syria. And I believe that as long as we should, as, as long as we oppose with very good reasons, a forceful return of Syrian refugees to the Turkish occupied territories in northern Syria, we will have to be ready and willing to pay for housing and or hosting Tur uh, Syrian refugees in Turkey itself. And uh, so I believe that for the European Union, it's the right way to proceed with financial support um, uh, for uh, Syrian refugees on, 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 on Turkish soil. And there are also very good arguments for helping the Turkish government and the Turkish administration uh, to modernize its asylum um, and refugee uh, system, management system uh, more generally, because there is a lot of pressure from refugees uh, turning to Turkey from other uh, countries as well, such as Afghanistan. And so there's a, 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 generally, a generally European interest in, uh, in propping up uh, Turkey's um, refugee management uh, system uh, along uh, international uh, uh, law uh, guidelines. And, uh, and so um, this seems to me the most promising part of the EU-Turkey relationship uh, in, in these days. When it comes to customs union, let me just um, tell you that um, before we start debating any extension or modernization of the customs union, the existing legal framework needs to be probably implemented. And there, is, there, is, there are more and more uh, examples of Turkey arbitrarily restricting access uh, to its, its market. Uh, uh, and uh, before these issues are not solved, there cannot be any progress made uh, on other fields, uh, such as um, agricultural services. And let me just repeat that I'm very much in doubt about the readiness of the Erdogan government uh, to start uh, talks about public procurement policy in the context of the customs union, um, because this government has changed Turkish national public procurement law, I don't know, dozens of times, uh, which led to a lot of intransparency and corruption uh, in the field of public procurement. And so any um, modernization of the customs union and any application of transparent uh, neutral rules of public procurement to uh, Turkish authorities would diminish the economic clout uh, of uh, Erdogan friendly uh, businesses in Turkey, which I would really uh, love to see. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I really doubt that Erdogan will, will be ready to do that. We should test it but only after uh, having um, 
solved all the problems of the existing uh, customs union framework. So I hope that uh, we will continue dialogue with Turkey and uh, we should, as a as European Union, focus on one thing that is the next general election in Turkey. Because um, you, many people in uh, European capitals are really upset about the uh, reduction in, 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 in media freedom, about human rights uh, um, abuses and so on in Turkey. Uh, but still there is this, a chance that even in unfair elections, the opposition will prevail or a new coalition uh, will prevail. And uh, this is the most important thing we should strive at, that democracy in Turkey survives and that there is a peaceful change of government um, by the Turks uh, themselves. And this should be the focus of our common European strategy. And that also means that we should not fall into the trap of Erdogan, who loves to pick up personal fights with uh, foreign leaders. Uh, be it Macron, be it Angela Merkel, be it Heiko Maas, because he needs a foreign enemy uh, to stand up as a fight for Turkish independence and uh, the, the, the rights of the Turkish nation uh, for the domestic um, public. And so um, I, I think that we in Europe, especially France and Germany, Germany need to coordinate more closely on EU policy towards Turkey in order to avoid this kind of grand, grand uh, political bickering, uh, which we've seen over the last uh, 15 months between uh, Macron and Erdogan. I think that, that this uh, is a big, big mistake and plays only into Erdogan's hands. And so, um, uh, we should really uh, stand up for our values, uh, stand up for democracy in Turkey, offer opportunities for cooperation where this can, uh, where this can uh, be um, implemented uh, under these circumstances. But we should not uh, give um, Erdogan the easy way out of his... Uh, self-defeating uh, policies um, back home. And so um, I'm really glad to have this uh, debate because I also think that uh, with our Greek friends, we, we have to debate uh, this uh, more openly and more closely, not only when it comes to Cyprus or the Eastern Mediterranean. And um, as always, Germany needs a common European approach um, in foreign policy. Uh, to have a strong, uh, to 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 have uh, to 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 influence the course of things, and uh, that's why I'm really glad uh, to be part of this uh, debate. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Schmidt, for making some very important points, including the significance of the migration question, as well as Germany's unique sensitivity to domestic developments in Turkey, given the presence of this uh, large immigrant community. I will now pass the floor to Professor Dimitris Kiridis, who is a professor of international relations at Panduk University and an MP for New Democracy. So Professor Kiridis combines a unique perspective because he is an academic and a politician. So I would be grateful if you can share your insights on how the Greek public and the Greek government has viewed the recent European Council decision and the future of the Turkey relations, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Grigoriadis, dear Yanis. Um, thank you for inviting me and making part of your uh, prestigious panel and congratulate you. I would like to congratulate you on the initiative. It's very important that we have this uh, public dialogue uh, at the highest possible quality on a matter of great importance that has dominated uh, the headlines, not only here in Greece, uh, but all over Europe. And uh, I'm afraid we'll continue to uh, dominate the news uh, uh, for the time to come. 
Let me start by being very frank. I have listened to all the uh, comments uh, made very carefully. Uh, let me start by being very frank and uh, saying that uh, I cannot but uh, express my greatest disappointment on the development of EU-Turkey relations and on the de developments uh, in Turkey itself over uh, the years. Uh, this is especially true for people such as us, such as myself, liberals, who had believed in uh, uh, Turkey's democratization, uh, modernization and reform efforts uh, back in the 2000s and uh, in the rapprochement of Turkey with the uh, EU. Uh, this is uh, furthermore especially true for Greek liberals because allow me to say that no other country inside the EU has been more sincere and uh, forceful in its support for uh, EU Turkey rapprochement than Greece. Uh, more than uh, many of uh, other uh, um, uh, quote unquote friends of Turkey today uh, in Europe um, who would like to have a special relationship with Turkey uh, but uh, were hesitant to really um, uh, integrate it into the uh, EU for a number of reasons. Uh, Greece, after Helsinki, after 1999, uh, extended uh, a very uh, open uh, uh, arm uh, uh, towards Turkey. Uh, and thus, uh, recent developments, uh, after 2013, the Gezi Park uh, uh, riots, uh, the breaking with the Yulenists, the espousal of the uh, most uh, extreme nationalistic elements in the Turkish political spectrum, the MHP, the failed coup of 2016, and everything that has followed ever since, uh, can only be a, a, a great, uh, a serious uh, uh, disappointment. We wish for things to have evolved uh, uh, differently, uh, but this is not something uh, uh, that uh, uh, we can choose. Uh, it is something uh, for the Turkish people uh, uh, to choose, and uh, we, will, we will be watching carefully uh, for the choices uh, uh, to be made uh, uh, from uh, uh, now on. I think there should be uh, no doubt that uh, uh, Greece um, will uh, uh, defend uh, its sovereignty and its sovereign rights uh, against uh, any incursions. But moreover, it will defend the European acquis. Uh, the European acquis, which consists on the respect of uh, rule of law and uh, human rights, and international law as a basis for international relations in Europe of the 21st century. And I think this is very elemental and uh, very basic. Uh, Turkey, uh, no matter how generous one wants to be, uh, has been a force of destabilization, especially recently. It has conducted three wars uh, uh, in 2020, in uh, Libya, in Syria, uh, and in the Caucasus. Uh, it has said things that come directly from the 1930s and the darkest uh, uh, periods of, Greek, uh, of European uh, history. Uh, it has confronted and created uh, enemies, as uh, it was just mentioned uh, by my German colleague, uh, in the face of uh, Merkel and Macron uh, and uh, so many others uh, around uh, 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 Europe. We are not talking about a misunderstanding. We are not, something, we are not talking about something uh, that can be resolved with some niceties. We are talking about a fundamental rupture. Uh, with what uh, uh, Europe uh, 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 represents. I think it should not be underestimated as well uh, the Anglo-Saxon uh, developments vis-a-vis uh, -vis EU-Turkey relations, uh, because in that relationship there was always a third party in Washington very much involved. I think the departure of Britain from EU uh, has made the EU-Turkish relations, uh, objectively speaking, uh, uh, more difficult because Britain, for its own reasons, was always very supportive of enlargement and uh, uh, of uh, a more lenient relationship vis-a-vis -vis Ankara. And obviously in the past, it was Washington's very strong interest 
in seeing Turkey being integrated into Europe uh, played that role, uh, which is no more. I think recent developments, including what happened in the recent EU summit, where uh, we had uh, Joe Biden's presence, and he referred specifically uh, on Turkey, uh, making sure uh, that matters of uh, human rights uh, uh, cannot be uh, uh, ignored. Uh, this has to do with uh, Washington's sincere belief uh, in uh, Western values, but also uh, if one is a cynic uh, in its uh, attempt uh, uh, to use uh, human rights, democracy, freedom as the ideological underpinning in its fundamental confrontation with China in the 21st century. And thus it is a point that will not go away. Uh, and it's not um, uh, uh, something uh, rhetorical, but he has a geostrategic uh, uh, substance. Uh, so, um, before I conclude, I'll say uh, Cyprus obviously is very uh, important, but I'm afraid, no matter how optimistic one uh, would like to be, that the result of the forthcoming uh, uh, five-party uh, talks uh, organized by the UN is uh, a foregone conclusion uh, because uh, uh, recent elections in uh, occupied Cyprus uh, 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 were stolen. Uh, there is no doubt about that. We had a brutal, uh, forceful uh, intervention on the part of the Turkish regime against the wishes of the local Turkish Cypriot uh, uh, community with the help of settlers and their votes. This is something, it's not me uh, who I say, it's something the Turkish Cypriots themselves who say it and say it out loud in demonstrations, repeated demonstrations, and by the leader who lost, uh, uh, former president Akinci, and his people in uh, 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 Cyprus. The puppets of Ankara were installed uh, in uh, uh, representing now uh, 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 Turkey's uh, Cyprus, and they have uh, followed the tune of, uh, uh, of Ankara, making sure that uh, nothing uh, positive will come out of uh, uh, these uh, forthcoming uh, uh, talks, I'm afraid. So here we are uh, in a very difficult uh, situation where Turkey has fast emerged as a major problem and concern. And I think realistically speaking, one has to uh, do two things. Uh, first, try to manage the relationship uh, as, as best as uh, um, uh, it can be managed, uh, minimizing frictions and tensions, uh, uh, taking advantage of whatever openings here and there, but without uh, entertaining any illusions uh, for the fundamental shift that is taking place in Turkey that has to do not only with Erdogan, because if one uh, is to go beyond uh, Erdogan, uh, he would not be, she would not be uh, uh, particularly optimistic. Uh, because it seems to me that there is a competition uh, in the Turkish political spectrum, with few exceptions, there are exceptions uh, for sure, uh, who is the most extremist, revisionist, uh, aggressive uh, uh, abroad. And uh, um, a, 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 a uniting of uh, the majority of uh, major political forces around the Blue Homeland uh, Doctrine, uh, which is obviously a doctrine of hegemonizing the Eastern Mediterranean against which uh, no literal country uh, would agree, nor Israel, nor Egypt, uh, let alone Cyprus or Greece, France uh, or United States. This hegemonic bid uh, for uh, dominating uh, the Eastern Mediterranean through the Blue Helmet uh, uh, Doctrine. So here we are. A, uh, to manage the relationship realistically uh, as a very problematic uh, uh, relationship in the hope that sometime in the future an alternative, uh, a positive uh, alternative uh, uh, might uh, return, which I uh, uh, very uh, strongly 
uh, doubt because there are the geostrategic forces that are pulling the two sides uh, apart, no matter uh, what we would like to wish and believe. And the second, equally important, if not more important, is to manage uh, the potential split uh, within the EU uh, uh, because of Turkey and other problems such as Turkey. Uh, Europe, with great difficulty, has managed to retain a certain unity uh, during the past uh, uh, few months. Uh, but uh, the tensions within the EU, vis-à-vis uh, -vis Turkey or vis-à-vis -vis Russia, for example, have been uh, growing and there should be a renewed effort not to allow them to spill out of control. I, I want to be very frank. Uh, that uh, Turkey is posing a challenge for European unity and European credibility and European standing uh, uh, in the world. If it cannot manage uh, its neighborhood, uh, what can it manage when it comes to uh, foreign policy, one uh, could ask. Uh, obviously, the climate, Yanis, as you probably know and you follow in Greece, has been very negative over uh, the past uh, few months. Uh, the Greek people have followed very closely uh, in a way that uh, it is hard to grasp uh, if you are not within Greece, the developments uh, inside Turkey. Uh, this is a daily headline news, for better or worse, and uh, the Greek public has been very much alerted to uh, the dangers and risks uh, that this uh, aggression uh, uh, poses. Uh, and even for people uh, such as myself, who uh, would self-characterize uh, as uh, moderate, liberal, uh, truly wanting uh, to see a constructive relationship between the two sides for the benefit of both uh, people, there is no doubt that uh, um, the situation has been uh, a, disappoint a, a disappointment. And uh, um, um, this is where uh, uh, we stand. Uh, the Greek people overall would like to see uh, more uh, from the EU. Uh, there is uh, uh, some concern with Germany, obviously, to be frank. Uh, and uh, uh, sincere. Uh, there is obviously always uh, a residue of uh, populism and uh, populists uh, um, everywhere, in Greece uh, as well, uh, that would uh, exploit uh, the situation in order to gain politically uh, and uh, um, uh, to exploit uh, um, a certain feeling of victimhood. Uh, this is for us responsible politicians uh, to manage and to uh, overcome. But uh, I cannot but say that the situation has been uh, very, very uh, 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 difficult. Uh, and um, uh, something that we will, we are and will continue to uh, follow uh, very closely. Thank you for giving me the time and to share my thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for these very insightful and frank comments. We're running out of time and we need to read the questions that our audience has sent. So I suggest that Funda reads the questions we have all together, and then each of you have three minutes to respond to questions that are directly addressed to you or in general to the, to the speakers. So, Funda? Yes, uh, thank you. There were a couple of questions um, that, uh, well, refer to the domestic situation in, uh, in Turkey, uh, also the German-France uh, couple, uh, as well as the Cyprus issue uh, and the migration. So I think this is very um, interesting question. So I'm simply going to read them uh, by how they came in. And I think you can then simply pick and choose what you would want to address. So the first one is from Alexander Karapiperis. Uh, so what do you think are the main motives in order to understand the stance of Germany to turn a blind eye vis-a-vis -vis Erdogan autocratic regime and mistakenly to offer just carrots? 
Are they mainly um, are they mainly a geopolitical? Really questionable after the uncontrollable hard power projection of Turkey last year, Syria, Libya, East Med, uh, Karabakh. Mainly economical, financial, huge trade volume of uh, 12,000 German enterprises in Turkey, or mainly domestically, fear of rise of um, a AfD, migration and blackmailing of 2 million Turkish voters in German elections. Um, Arne Schild, uh, Schildberg um, uh, has uh, put three questions. The first one is on migration. What is the issue if we have to handle, uh, we have to handle if we can manage the migration flows or how we can handle the migration flows? How can uh, Greece, the EU and Turkey work together to create a working and humanitarian border regime? How can resettlements from Turkey to EU member states be part of the solution? Um, And then he also uh, asked a question on Cyprus. How has this year's election impacted the way ahead and the possibilities for a solution to the Cyprus question? And finally, um, the question on EU members and EU-Turkey relations. How is the different position of France and Germany impacting a common EU-Turkey policy? And then... Um, A second question by Alexandra Karapiperis. He, he um, directed it directly towards Mr. Schmidt, but maybe others would also want to come in. But uh, that is then relating to uh, the German elections. Do you think in case we will have green SPD FDP coalition government after the September 2021 elections, Germany will change its foreign policy towards Turkey? Is it value-based, um, i.e. embargo arms sales? So that is um, the list of questions. It's a full list. I'm sure you're not, uh, I'm not going to be able to address all of them within three minutes. But uh, why don't we go in reverse order? If some of you would want to, um, to address some of the questions or simply make a final statement, you're certainly invited to you. So Mr. Karidis, Car would you want to, to start? And then we go in reverse order. Uh <laughs> Three minutes. <laughs> um, I don't know where to start from because I think I already uh, kind of addressed a few. Uh, the elections in Cyprus, for example, uh, where we had uh, uh, what I just uh, described, uh, um, the stealing of uh, the democratic will of the uh, indigenous Uh, Cypriot, Turkish Cypriot uh, population, and uh, a very um, uh, brutal and open and unashamed uh, effort to uh, determine uh, the outcome against the forces of moderation and in favor of uh, the forces of extremism, as represented today by uh, the new uh, president of the Turkish Cypriot community. Uh, migration is obviously a very big uh, uh, issue. Um, uh, what uh, Europe uh, is not willing to uh, accept is the instrumentalization of the matter and the blackmailing of Europe uh, on the part of uh, non-European powers, including Turkey. Uh, this is something that uh, all of uh, Europe understood uh, a year ago to this uh, day, back in March 2020, uh, when we had uh, uh, the effort from the uh, Erdogan regime uh, to uh, uh, bus in uh, irregular migrants and refugees uh, forcefully Uh, through the Greek borders, the land border up in the northeast of uh, Greece. And as far as democracy is concerned, uh, one uh, can only read with uh, a great um, concern and disappointment the continuous uh, uh, sleeping of uh, Turkey in the international indexes of uh, uh, democracy. Um, all of the indexes, there are several, uh, point to that uh, uh, degradation of the quality, most of them uh, speak of no democracy anymore, of a hybrid regime that has elections uh, and regular elections and referenda as a facade uh, with the lack of the fundamental underpinnings of a liberal democracy, the independent judiciary, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, something that uh, this uh, lack of independence institutions, something that we've seen not only as politicians or academicians, Uh, but even, uh, Lord and behold, uh, the international markets recently, with the expulsion once more of the central banker. Uh, because no matter what we say, 
uh, is allow me to be modest of limited value when it comes to the power of the money markets and the stock exchanges. And what we've seen uh, the previous 10 years is exactly that beyond the reports of Borel, the reports of the human rights uh, organization of Amnesty International, who reads them and who cares about them. But what we've seen in a very spectacular way is this implosion of the Turkish lira and the Turkish stock market by the fact that there are no institutions. There is the one man's rule uh, who decides on his personal uh, whims on policy. And this goes all across uh, public policy these days, I'm afraid, in Turkey, including foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, uh, Niels Schmidt, um, the floor is yours for also final remarks and thoughts. Yeah, I've already elaborated on uh, the France-Germany uh, uh, issue uh, and the need for more uh, cooperation between the two in uh, advancing a common EU policy towards Turkey. Uh, this has become really uh, crucial uh, over the last uh, 15 months, I believe. Um, I, I pick just one of the uh, questions that is uh, the, 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 the future uh, coalition government in Germany. So I hope that it will be led by Olaf Scholz for sure. Um, and, and when it comes to arms sales and uh, restrictions of arms sales, then it's really, really important to have a government without the Christian Democrats. Because for the time being, they are uh, blocking any uh, tightening of arms exports rules in, in Germany. Uh, the SPD uh, and also the Greens, uh, for evident reasons, are willing uh, to tighten these rules. Um, the problem is that NATO, in the case of Turkey, that NATO, that NATO members usually uh, are not included in or are not uh, concerned by um, these uh, restrictions. And uh, so we are having a very difficult uh, limit arms sales to Turkey. There has been uh, some uh, attempts uh, made at that um, when it comes to modernizing uh, um, Leopard 10, well, as long as uh, Turkey is a NATO member state, this is uh, very, very difficult. And in a way, the question of arms restrictions by Europe does not cover the whole picture. The reality is not only Turkey, but other emerging uh, market economies like Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Brazil, to build a national defense industry, which means that they start to produce their weapons on their own, in part quite modern weaponry. And so arm, arms sales restrictions do not really um, uh, uh, from developing their own arms industry. And this is a real challenge. So in the future, we do not only need European rules on arms sales, we also need to develop international rules on um, arms control, uh, conventional arms control in a much broader manner than we used to. And uh, this is a challenge which has been underestimated by, by many foreign policy makers. Uh, Heiko Maas has started a debate on, on that. And uh, in the future, this will be of more relevance. The, the very prominent issue um, of arms sales restrictions on a national or European level. Thank you uh, very much. And now, uh, Panayotis Yokamidis, uh, your final three minutes and your points taken you want to mention. Please unmute your, your mic. Please unmute your microphone. Yes. Okay, thank you. I want to make just two points, one on migration, the other on Cyprus. Now, on migration, well, the EU Turkey statement on migration has worked to a certain degree, 
and it needs to continue for a certain period of time. That is important with a revision, perhaps. But the real answer to the problem lies somewhere else. The European Union needs to formulate a genuine my common migration and asylum policy to address this problem. The EU Turkey statement has practically outsourced its migration policy to Turkey. And that's not a real, a real answer to the problem. So this is highly important. But unfortunately, the European Union seems unable to do that, to formulate this, this policy. But we have to insist on that particular, on that particular point. On the Cyprus question, I think that it is important, it is imperative to find common ground on the model of bisonal, bicommunal federation, because that's going to be the real solution to the problem. The two-state solution, it will not provide a real solution, a genuine solution. It will be a source for friction forever quite a part that it will condemn the northern part of Cyprus to being permanently outside the European Union. And the Turkey Cyprus citizens who want, want to, be, to be part of the European Union. And for that, only a federated state can actually provide, provide, the, provide the answer. But to have a federation, both sides need to make certain steps. The Greek um, Cypriot sides need to recognize full political equality, something which is extremely important because that is part of a federated state, political equality. Without it, it cannot be any federal solution. And of course, Turkey and the Turkey Cypriot leadership to abandon the idea for a two-state for a two-state solution. I am not very optimistic, but I have to insist on that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you um, also for keeping uh, it short and precise. Uh, Wolfgang Wessels, uh, it's your time for your three minutes. Yeah, I don't want to go too much in detail in each question, for example, arms exports, I think that had been mentioned. I would like to come back to my first point. And I think I would like to tie that to our Greek and Cyprus friends. Here, the European Union West European Council Declaration shows full solidarity, first of all. Uh, why should an Irish person drinking his beer in the pub, perhaps no, not nowadays, given the Corona <laughs> crisis, why should he be interested in that? Let's be frank. I think that's a good sign that the European Council takes that as serious. Uh, and this also refers to the Franco-German uh, conversion. Um, there are different ways always between France and Germany on all issues of international politics, uh, wherever you can start from. Uh, but at the end, they try to find a common solution. And here, in this text, which is full of ambiguities, uh, I totally agree with that, uh, they found in the moment a starting point to get together. And I would like, as somebody said, um, make that as trial. And I think the European Council wants to do it as a trial. They come back in June, they have this kind of formulation. I repeat that because I like that in the formulation here that it's about the, let's say, uh, proportional and reversible um, manner faced pro pro proportionate and reversed, uh, reversible manner. I think that's an offer now to start from uh, and uh, to see how far, let's say on the Turkish side, this is being taken up. Uh, I agree, we won't solve basically some of the basic problems which I enumerated uh, on all sides. Uh, but uh, let's say, uh, what are the alternatives to do in the moment? Uh, I, I wouldn't see any clear alternative which might not increase the cost for everybody. It uh, would be a negative sum gain if we increase the points. 
So I think that's a way. Uh, I understand partly the German government. We know that Merkel uh, is perhaps in this sense thinking in the realist terms. Uh, she has visiting Turkey and moments of Erdogan's uh, election campaign, etc. So I think uh, she has a certain point, or if her successor will be different, I don't know. Uh, and uh, whatever the position will be, there is a certain kind of basic factors, both domestically, economically, to try to keep some kind of bridge uh, with Turkey. Uh, and that might not be, let's say, following the values which we, we share all and which are clearly mentioned in the European um, treaties. So I think we must live with that, but uh, this is a step. And uh, I propose, Funda, to come back again, Johannes, uh, in uh, end of June after the next European Council meeting. And then we look what has happened. I wouldn't make any expectation in the moment. I'm not in this sense optimistic, but I think that's a chance to go, try to go ahead. Uh, if this is being then uh, put really into practice and gets effective, uh, I don't really know. And it's very difficult to predict because it very much depends on internal dynamics in Turkey. And here I agree on many of other uh, situations, but uh, at least it's an offer. And I think we should keep that for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang, also for the more op optimistic uh, tone and towards the end. And now, Senem, it's your turn. Very much, Funda. I really enjoyed this discussion. I just want to finish on three points um, based on what's been uh, discussed so far by the other speakers. Now, I think there is this dilemma that Europe is facing in the sense that, on the one hand, I do slightly disagree with Mr. Karida's point, and I agree with Professor Wessel's point, that I think the European Union seems to be uh, standing on solid ground, right, when it comes to issues concerning Eastern Mediterranean. I don't see much disunity there, despite the fact that, as Professor Wessel's pointed out, some member states have absolutely no stake or no interest whatsoever on whatever happens between Greece, Cyprus and Turkey and the Eastern Mediterranean. So I think we have to put it there and, and think of these issues as, as you know, uh, rather uh, an end of a compromise and consensus and bargaining and you know when you consider that that's still an outcome having said that I think the difficulty is this now on the one hand we talk about Eastern Mediterranean and Turkish foreign policy and this and that and then we look at EU Turkey relations from more and more geopolitical lenses mm. and reduce the relationship mainly to geopolitics and whatever is happening in the Eastern Mediterranean or whatever Turkey is doing in Greece and Cyprus when you do that you take what I said at the beginning, values out of the relationship. So it's one thing to stand in solidarity or whatever for the European partners, but it's another thing to sort of forego anything that relates to domestic governments, which uh, is just, you know, compromise or thrown out of the window for geopolitical ends. And I think that is the dilemma. That is the difficulty. That's the catch-22 that somehow Europe needs to get itself out of. And I think that this is, this is a serious problem. Uh, for Europe as well. I mean, the issue of democracy in Turkey, it's not just a matter of, you know, a, a important hurdle to any sustainable foreign policy cooperation between EU and Turkey, but it's also, I think, an important sort of, it's a potential dynamite even for European democracy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Turkey abolishes the Istanbul Convention, who runs to applaud it, you know, the Poles and the, and the Hungarians. So I think one needs to uh, consider the transnational dimension of all this that is going on. So whatever is domestic to Turkey is no longer only domestic to Turkey. So it's very difficult to have foreign policy cooperation and let Turkey get away with whatever it's doing domestically. Secondly, I agree with uh, Professor Panagiotis on PESCO and EDF. That would be wonderful in an ideal world, of course, which we're not operating in, uh, obviously, because of Cyprus issue because of the double veto that exists. Um, and unfortunately, yes, political equality would be an important condition, but here I harbor doubts as to whether Greek Cypriots really are willing to give that political equality to their counterparts, as we've seen in the referendum over the Anand plan, I don't think they're ready for that. And I don't think the EU has any leverage on them anymore to get them to push to recognize uh, the political equality that the Turkish Cypriots actually deserve. And the third point, of course, on um, the future. 
And I know I started off rather pessimistic, but let's just finish on an optimistic note. Um, and I'll try to do that. I think it's been mentioned that, you know, Turkish society beyond Erdogan is also a tendency to be super nationalistic and pro-aggressive foreign policy. I strongly disagree with that. Um, obviously, Turkish society is also a society that is nationalist. Nationalist feelings are quite strong just like they are in Greece, right? So the two societies are very similar in the degree and style and shape of nationalism that they both harbor. But having said that, I don't think it's fair to place all of the Turkish political parties and movements in the same basket. And I would agree um, that one factor, which perhaps beyond Erdogan might one day, might facilitate perhaps dialogue, multilateralism, and solution on these fronts would also be the fact that these issues are not of number one primary importance for Turkish society. They might be in Greece, but they really are not for Turkey. So, and that often helps sometimes for politicians to be able to make certain compromises when the push comes to the shove and when the political leaders have the political will to do so. And I think that gives us some ground for optimism. Thank you from that. Thank you, Sinem, for also ending on a positive and optimistic note. And um, yeah, I think now it's time for my three minutes, actually, for um, having some concluding thoughts and uh, to take home with. But I think, first of all, I would like to thank you for this very interesting uh, debate. Um, I think it was highly topical, highly relevant. Um, as always, it's um, most often is the case with uh, debates on EU-Turkey relations. We identify the problems, we uh, heatedly discuss the problems, and then maybe identify more questions than we might have answers to, to it. But what I think I heard um, throughout the debate today is also we have to manage the relationship. And here I would like to um, put that into a context of um, the findings of our Horizon 2020 project on the future of EU-Turkey relations, where we concluded and said, you know, the, the most likely scenario for the future of EU-Turkey relations can be framed as conflictual cooperation. And I think if you then look at what happened uh, last year and, uh, and now the development since de December, it's really the expression of this conflictual uh, cooperation, you know, having very much intentions and conflict towards the end of, of last year, but now with um, the, the report and then the different postponements and the reflections, you really see the need for cooperation. So I think this is something that we have to, to keep in mind. And um, there are, of course, the strategic interests, like uh, Wolfgang pointed out. Um, Senem, you really reminded us also of then having the, uh, the importance of not taking out the values completely. And as I said also earlier, I think I'm reading, um, you know, the statement of last week as a more positive sign that there is at least some reference to um, rule of law in there, but I fully agree that we have to get back to the conditionality of it. And I think this is something uh, that uh, we can then also in, um, think about, and this is also the, the big question that is then has to be um, solved or tackled till the June Council maybe. Um, it's then, and Wolfgang managed to it, we have the positive agenda and now we have a clearer idea of what the positive agenda could look like due to the report of Pharrell. But then the key question and the $1 million question is again, how can we manage it and how can it look like institutionally, how to go about what, where to start actually and how to phase it and I think these are then the, the issues that um, the politicians have to wrap their minds around but we as academics and think tankers are also um, asked to really think about and uh, think of where to start first and I think um, the, the modernization of the customs union is something where we can start first but here I also find it and this is more an observation that also Senem um, highlighted is very interesting um, that it's now linked more to Cyprus than to the political conditionality and I think this is also when you look at the report of uh, Borel, it's really that Cyprus has been an elephant in the room for, you know, so many decades now. And I think now it's really putting 
uh, you know, being pulled out of the shades and it's now up front there. And I mean, I think uh, there are more about 30 references to Cyprus in the, uh, in the Borel report. So I think this is really something that is now at the forefront, of course, also due to the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean. But this is then also something, an issue that has to be solved both to progress with, uh, with the customs union, with the association, uh, with also the ex uh, accession uh, procedure, because there Cyprus is also a, a big obstacle. So I think um, this is something to really now um, get uh, our focus on. And uh, he, I also agree that the mi migration policy, I think it was Neil Schmidt who uh, emphasized it also, is something that uh, where you have mutual um, interests and where you then can start um, co um, your cooperation. And maybe this would be something to start the positive agenda first. But also the people-to-people uh, -people contacts and the high-level dialogues is something that I think should be taken up again. And uh, the people-to-people -people contact, this is why we have these kind of debates. And uh, Wolfgang already said it. Um, we definitely are determined to continue our engagement on EU-Turkey relations, having such uh, debates. And I'm really looking forward to maybe meet, uh, uh, meeting each other in such a circle in June after the next European Council, but hopefully also before. So, Yanis, if you want um, to, to wrap up. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Funda, for your comments. I would like to highlight the significance of values and norms in EU-Turkey relations as a common point in all presentations of our distinguished speakers. I would like to thank each of you for your contributions. It was a great honor and pleasure to be with you this evening. I would like also to thank Funda for your cooperation. And we look forward to seeing you in another event, hopefully in June, following the next uh, European Council Summit. Thank you very much indeed.